story of Laura Pun, a plane passenger caught up in a terrorist hijacking before the plane is hit by a meteorite and crashes into the snowlands of northern Canada. Laura and the few survivors of the crash, including an addict named Kimberly and a little girl named Janny, brace the wilderness and horrible plant-like monsters growing out of those killed in the crash and soon discover the cause of the crash and a force trying to destroy the entire world. This is the story of D2. The game would arrive only a little over a week before the new millennium in Japan, while Americans would have to wait until the summer of 2000. And Europeans wouldn't get the game at all, although it would be reviewed in some magazines there. I've made some mistakes with my earlier videos, notably getting a voice actor's role wrong, but I think the biggest one is definitely that I don't really talk enough about the people behind these games, especially when I was talking about MK Gold. Allow me to remedy this mistake. Unavoidably so, it's hard to talk about D2 without not talking about its creator and designer, Kenji Ino, the man, the myth, the legend, and one of the many auteurs to come out of 90s Japanese video games. He also composed the music for a bunch of his games, including this one. Under the stewardship of Kenji Ino and Warp, we would see the release of many interesting titles such as D, Enemy Zero, Real Sound, Kaze no Wind, and a lot of stuff for the 3DO you've probably never heard of because it only came out in Japan. There are a lot of interesting stories surrounding him, like the fact he was able to get a critically acclaimed film composer, Michael Ryman, to do the music for Enemy Zero simply by finding out he was visiting Japan, intercepting him, and then spent six hours buttering him up and pleading him to do the music, or his famous revenge plot against Sony for underproducing copies of D for the PlayStation. This revenge would consist of him presenting his following game, Enemy Zero, at the Sony Expo, only to sneak in that it would be a Sega Saturn exclusive. He also apparently claims to have punched a Sony rep when there were no PS1 copies at his local electronics store. <laughs> the star of D2 is Laura. She's also the star of D and Enemy Zero, but she is not the same Laura in either of these games, for she is a virtual actress created by Kenji Ino. What this means basically is a fictitious character used to portray different characters between games, treating her like she's real. It's kind of a bit like how Gorillaz is a cartoon band played by real musicians, Indeed, the whole star appeal of a virtual actress was so important to Kenji Ino that in order to promote D2, he had her pose for a fashion magazine. It may not be a surprise to some of you that D2 was not always fated for the Dreamcast, but rather for the Panasonic M2, a platform intended to be a successor to the 3DO. This version of the game was not only halfway finished, but also would have featured an entirely different story, with a few similar plot beats. In this version, you would have not played as Laura, but her son, who is taken away from Laura before birth by the devil, instead sent hundreds of years in the past to be the son of Vlad the Impaler, who gave his soul to the devil for a son. As an adult, you would escape from a European castle to save Vlad from the devil. This version would not be released, as the M2 would not make it to the market. At least, not as a home console. This obviously did not make Kenji Ino particularly happy to hear that his work was all for naught. Instead of reworking the game for a different platform, he scrapped it and started again from scratch. My original contract with Sega for D2 was to continue creating this new game, but I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to go back and create the exact same thing, so that's why I changed it. And I don't know why, but I'd always want to show snow in my games. It was summertime in Japan, but I brought my team to New Zealand, and when I saw the snow there, I just decided to change the game. The CGI animation for these cutscenes is pretty good for the time, and the amount of them is pretty impressive although in-engine cutscenes are also decent as well. Overall, the graphics for 99-2000 are probably one of the strongest aspects of this game, even if a lot of the environments kind of look the same. Even though a lot of the environments look the same and it gets kind of boring to traverse, there is a great atmosphere kept to it in the sound design and music.
Although, that being said, for as impressive as the CGI and in-engine cutscenes are, uh, the English dub lip-syncing is not very good. Help, huh? I bet all the people you victimized until now pleaded for their lives in the same way, huh? Stop! Please! Help! Pitiful. Help! Shh. You're hurting my ears. Shut up, will you? My head hurts. It's pounding. There are a lot of dialogue scenes which are there for the characters to talk and interact, and I like this. The original prototype version of D2 would have featured real-time combat, which is brought over here but not quite in the same way, for D2 is a survival horror game from the third-person perspective. Except it's also not just that, but it's also kind of an RPG because it has leveling up, because you level up from fighting enemies. Oh, and also the combat switches to a first-person rail shooter. It's hard to talk about D2 without talking about the monsters themselves. These pretty horrible plant-like creatures growing out of or blossoming out of their victims. It almost seems like the bodies they come out of are dragged by them. They're an interesting villain design, especially the way that they seem to drag their hosts around once they've grown. And the easiest way to kill them is obviously with a gun. Default gun is the submachine gun, which has unlimited ammunition although you will have to keep reloading it. Other guns, like the shotgun and the handgun, which is made redundant by the shotgun which you get earlier, have a limited ammunition, so you have to collect cartridges for them. And then there's also grenades, which you can throw and do damage to all enemies on screen, which is useful, but they don't work on bosses. I kind of ended up saving them on the path to the end to the final boss. The submachine gun is later made redundant by the semi-automatic, which is a lot better. And obviously, when you take damage in this game, there are a few ways to heal. The first is leveling up, which by default sends you back to full health. The second way is sleeping in a bed. Third is collecting first aids. Or the fourth, and my favorite way, is killing animals and cooking them. Because on top of your assault weapons, you're also given a hunting rifle, which you use for hunting animals. And you use them to collect meats. And then you cook them with a portable cooker that you were given by Kimberly. Which, mind you, Laura probably could give George Stobart from Broken Sword a run for his money in a carrying as much shit as possible competition. You're effectively walking around with a full arsenal, a camera, a map, a fucking George Foreman grill. And it's not like women's clothing is known for having pockets. In fact, this is the Great Cold North. Earlier in the game, Kimberly tells Laura to carry a gun for safety, but why doesn't she tell her to put on some warmer clothing? She's out in the Great North in nothing but a dress and pantyhose. After the plane crash, your character Laura is asleep for over a week before she's awoken by Kimberly, but her makeup looks pretty immaculate for someone who's been asleep that long. Did Kimberly put the makeup on while she was sleeping? And indeed, in the third person perspective, the sound design is immaculate. But in the first person combat, it sounds a bit weird. <laughs> Pretty much every item interaction and walking through door in this game has a cutscene accompanying it, and sometimes it's skippable, only really when it's repeated. Environments for this game, as I've said earlier, are a bit repetitive, but they are broken up between each disc, so that makes navigation a bit easier. Although, the environments get much bigger after disc 1, and this is supplemented by the Snowmobile, which is unlocked in disc 2, which is a pain in the ass to control, but you just kind of have to get used to it. My advice is don't floor it and remember to steer with the analog stick. Enemy combat, you will take damage if you fail to divide your attention between the enemies because they will attack, so long as you don't hit their weak spots, which will stun them if you do. Oh yeah, and this game has boss battles. the snowy mountain setting, it's hard not to think about a lot of the influences for this game, the most obviously being Who Goes There, which was adapted into The Thing from Another World, which was then adapted into The Thing. It obviously gets a bit more esoteric from there. <laughs> And speaking of which, four discs. This is a four-disc Dreamcast game. 
Not that fucking pussy shit three disc CD game that Final Fantasy VII gave us. No, these are four GDI discs, filled to the gillies with mostly cutscenes and some gameplay. Okay, I might come off as a bit hypocritical, considering I was critical of the lack of gameplay in Sword of Berserk relative to its cutscenes, but that was really only because the game didn't feel substantial enough with them. With D2, it's about an 8-10 to 10 hour game, so I don't really mind how it's a lot more cutscene heavy because it feels at least a bit more like a substantial amount of content for what you're paying for. At least what you would have paid at the time, not so much now. Dun 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 What happened exactly? I was just sitting here worried because you were gone so long. Then all of a sudden the two of you just fell out of the sky. A bright golden light lit up the entire room and then boom. See? Look up there. How the hell are you not freezing already without a roof? Oh, you can actually spin the logo on the start screen with the analog stick. There's no real free roaming in first person, except for one section on the first disc, strangely enough. The rest is, is controlled. Yes, the music for this game was done by Kenji Ino himself. And for when you're out in the snow, there's a lot of simple tracks that evoke a very strong and clear atmosphere. There's a lot of extreme stuff for the time, like there's blood and decapitation, which is nothing, but even some brief nudity on disc 2. <laughs> My least favorite moment of the game is definitely disc 3, or as I like to call it, the backtracking disc, because that's most of what you're doing. It can take you between 20 to 30 minutes to backtrack through the whole of the location available on disc 3, only to realize I wasn't supposed to go that far till I got the snowmobile, so I wasted all my time walking in game. As it turns out, for the first half of disc 3, you're only supposed to backtrack between Piano Man's house that you're staying at, his mother's, and this weird stone chapel with this weird guy, and then you get the snowmobile. You know, that doesn't help because the random encounters which the enemies appear in, because this is an RPG as well as a survival horror and a shooter, you know, go from being, you know, a cute novelty to just being monotonous and annoying and only serve to break up the gameplay and tension. Yeah, I think Disc Point was the breaking point where I nearly quit the game, and I imagine a lot of people might have been tempted to. Most of the puzzles in this game aren't too bad, but the one that stuck out to me as particularly bad would definitely be the piano puzzle on Disc 3, where you have to replay a section of a song on the piano by an ear, with no visual indications of which notes you're supposed to press, which I suppose you'll have no problem with if you're a music student. I don't find it fun, and I'm not ashamed to admit I had to look up a walkthrough through to find out the right sequence for all the keys. But eventually, I beat the game. Disc 4 was a lot better in that it was a lot more cutscene, which, you know, I was kind of relieved after all the walking around on disc 3. There is some substantial gameplay on disc 4 still, the long walk up to the final boss, which has a great mood to it, and exploring the laboratory which was apparently founded by your parents. There's the boss battle against Laura's mother, which, um... No, I'm, I'm not going to say what this looks like. PUSSY! And of course, the final boss himself, who, my advice is, just save up enough shotgun shells because those will do the most substantial damage to him. But he has kind of an interesting thing where, over time, he will take away your senses in the game. First with your sight, then with your hearing, and then finally your movement, with your only way freeing you is to wait a while in the silent dark before you can hear anything, and then from your items you'll be able to select your compact, which has a flower in it. You're supposed to know that this is the solution to this puzzle, because before this, one of the dead passengers gives you a monologue about how, you know, being dead isn't so bad because someday, from where his decomposing corpse once lay, flowers might grow. The snow will soon cover my body. Time will cease to exist. And I'll disappear under the thickening layer of snow. And in that whiteness, all this will transform itself into water and earth. 
over a longer period of time than I ever could have imagined. And maybe one day, I'll come back again as a very small flower. I'll blossom and grow. But eventually you defeat the final boss, which kind of looks a bit like the biblically accurate angel. And to this, you are treated with your final cutscene. And a six minute montage of all the stock footage used during the Great Mother visions. And then a large wall of statistics, ranging from world population to illiteracy to famine and the AIDS epidemic. And then you get the end credits, with the final screen of the game simply being a simple clock counting down the days past the new millennium. Or alternatively, if you played the game before this in Japan, it would just count down towards the new millennium. And then, welcome to the 21st century once that had been reached. This game does not leave a lot to the imagination in terms of its themes and analysis. No man is truly evil or truly good. There is only the power of evil and the power of good, and all depends on how that power is applied. <laughs> A lot to do with the anxieties of the new millennium and Y2K, and, you know, your typical story of human and destruction towards themselves and the planet, and our responsibilities as such. With the ending stat screens clearly trying to hammer in that point as much as possible. The stock footage itself, there was a lot I'm actually interested in finding more about, because the only stock footage I could recognize personally was the stuff with the fall of the Berlin Wall, and some clips from the film Fall of the Roman Empire. That is, in a nutshell, the essence of D2. Kenji Ino's part pessimistic and part hopeful story to bring into the new century. A warning and a letter of hope at the same time. Is D2 a recommendable game today? Well, for starters, in terms of gameplay, it's probably the most accessible of the Laura trilogy. It's not as crushingly difficult as Enemy Zero, or as entirely rendered in pre-rendered animation as D. I don't think it's a particularly scary game, at least not as scary as other games I hope to cover on this channel. But it certainly does have a mood and atmosphere that I could definitely see myself wanting to play on a cold, frosty, snowy night, where all the lights are low. My advice is that if this looks like an interesting game to you from what I've shown, and you consider yourself a patient person, you will like this game. Otherwise, you will not like this game. That might not be the most glowing recommendation in the world, but I think it is a pretty good summary. Nonetheless, even if you're someone who can't get into Kenji Ino's work, you still owe him a bit of respect for his work in the games industry. Sadly though, this would be the last console game developed by Warp Team, as Kenji Ino would be ultimately driven away from the gaming industry to focus on other pursuits. Warp would ultimately be renamed to From Yellow to Orange. Kenji Ino would only work on, after this, a couple mobile games and a single console game called You, Me, and the Cubes for the Nintendo Wii Store. And more tragically, in 2013, he would pass away from hypertensive heart failure. He was only 42. As it has been said before, the candle that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. For many of us, we can only aspire to leave such a legacy like that. I'd be interested to look at other Warp games in the future. That being said, it is a shame that we never got to see the M2 version of D2, because as much as I do like the game that we did get, the original certainly looked interesting, and would have been a direct follow-up to the original D. Unfortunately, I'm not really holding out hope that it still exists within the world, but I won't deny that some of the concepts behind it would have certainly made for an interesting game. But, for the meantime, for September and October, I'm gonna be looking at a bunch of other horror-themed games, and potentially some other media, so... Until next time, goodbye. Davis.